I am so full of gratitude to be here today in this beautiful space known as the Heitai Heritage Center. The sense of history and heritage in this auspicious place is palpable. Just take a moment to breathe it in. Look around where you are. What a perfect place to come to, to honor black history. To hear a story that takes us back to the time of slavery in this country and brings us right into the present. As Joanne said today, it's made possible through the creative collaboration of three women and the collaboration of resources of the Durham Library Foundation and the Forest at Duke Retirement Community. And we welcome you all. You have the bios of these three women in your hands that tell you about their talent and brilliance they each bring to this performance. However, these, do, these notes do not tell you about the heart and soul that went into this creation, or how Scream's Echo came to be, or how these women found each other. It's a story that I hope you will ask them to share. A brief note about commitment. When Bobby, our um, founder of this, uh, the writer and narrator, was informed on Wednesday in, uh, while she's in, in uh, Florida, that the Atlanta airport was closed and there were no more seats available that would get her to Raleigh-Durham. So she calls me and she said, I'm getting in the car, I'm on my way. I said, Bobby, you're gonna drive right into the storm. I'm on my way, I'm already in the car, I'm on my way. She arrived at 11.30 Wednesday night I think you all remember what 11.30 Wednesday night looked like. She said there weren't a lot of people on Highway 40 with her, and so she could go 20 miles an hour. In the meantime, I managed to get to the airport before the storm, and I picked up Tahira and Kenyatta, who had flown in from Chicago. So they made it before the storm, so we had everyone in place whew, by Wednesday night. As the story they tell unfolds today, listen with your open hearts and minds. Listen with curiosity. Listen as though you are hearing this story for the first time. As you do so, I invite you to notice the thoughts and feelings that are evoked in you and that you will let your voice be heard and be part of creating a meaningful conversation after the story has been told. It is we, collectively, who make agreement as to how we will live together in our local community, our state community, our national community, and our global community. And that only happens when we talk about it. The performance of Scream's Echo is presented to create meaningful conversations and actions in order to enhance the ongoing and everyday work of creating equality and justice for all. Please help me welcome Tahira Whittington, who's going to uh, provide us with this beautiful solo, and then her cohorts, Tahira, I mean, <laughs> Bobby, O'Connor, and Kenyatta Williams. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tahira Whittington, as I've already been introduced. 
and I will shortly be joined by my colleagues, Bobby O'Connor, writer and narrator, as well as Kenyatta Williams, actress and singer. But before we get into the production of Scream's Echo, I want to play a piece by an African-American composer, Coleridge Taylor Perkinson, who lived in Chicago and New York and kind of caught the bug of classical music as well as jazz music and was so wonderful in collaborating the two genres. Um, in this piece called Lamentations for Solo Cello, I'll be playing the first movement out of three, or actually four. Um, the first one called Fuging Tune. And he was inspired by American composer William Billings, who also wrote Fuging Tunes during the Civil War time. But he was also um, inspired by J.S. Bach. Um, us being in this church, it's really, um, or this pa uh, past church that is now the uh, Harris Central Center or the Cultural Center, um, is a perfect place to um, perform Chorus Taylor Perkinson's work for solo cello because it reminds me of playing Bach. Um, and the perfect place to play Bach is in this kind of, kind of environment. This piece will remind you of spirituals, it will remind you of gospel, it will remind you of jazz, as well as classical all in one. This is Coleridge Taylor Perkinson's Lamentations, the first movement, Fuging Tune.
I want to invite uh, my colleagues, Bobby O'Connor and Kenyatta Williams to the stage. And we will begin our presentation, or actually, we will have a manuscript of uh, Scream's Echo, just about. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. We're honored that you came. Thank you. The works we're presenting today, you've already heard some about. I want to say a little more. It is about how the screams of racism echo through the centuries. These words came up and out of my soul and onto the page through my fingers. It was as if someone else were writing them. I'm a white woman who struggles to recognize my unearned privileges every day, to raise my consciousness as best I can. And at the end of every day, I must remember, I am still a recovering racist. I am abundantly clear that I have been sent here to this earthly plane to create equality and social justice so that there is truly room for all of us, every last one of us. There are two pieces today. The first is from a manuscript that I'm writing and it actually grew from the spoken word piece with music helping to weave the story. Both pieces point to the complexities of race in our world, then and now. Before I read from the manuscript, I want to give you a sense of the scene you'll be entering as you listen. It's 1864, just post-Emancipation Proclamation, on the Hughes Plantation in South Alabama. You will meet Charlie, and his mother, Minnie, his father, Moses, and his sister, Trudy, who are slaves. You'll also meet Belle, one of the kitchen workers. Later, you'll meet Master Hughes and his daughter, Martha. And then there will be the overseer and the other men. Please join me as we meet Minnie in the kitchen of the big house. During the summer that Minnie's boy began to grow into a man, she noticed the muscles rippling in his back and heard the huskiness of his voice. He was growing up to be responsible and a hard worker, just like his daddy. All this, coupled with those shining brown eyes that sparkled when he smiled, gave her great pleasure. But underneath that pleasure, there was something nagging at her that she couldn't quite put her finger on. Just yesterday, as she beat the batter for a special cake she was making for supper, she heard the young girls who came to help in the kitchen giggling in the corner. They were talking about her Charlie and how handsome he was. She <laughs> smiled, thinking about her boy and how he was becoming a man. Her smile became a deep furrow in her brow when Belle, her loyal friend and kitchen helper, came up beside her and whispered in her ear, Miss Minnie, the young missus was smiling at Charlie yesterday. She done walked right up to him in the fields. It's looking like Miss Martha done got her sights set on him. Minnie stood looking at Belle and knew they were headed for trouble. Heat rushed through her body and sweat trickled down her face from the edge of her head rag. All of a sudden, a long repressed memory all but struck Minnie, Minnie down, and she held on to the kitchen counter to keep from falling. She remembered like it was yesterday. She was a young girl playing in the woods and came upon a body hanging from a tree. She fainted right there in the dirt before she even saw the birds pecking at the man's face. 
Belle held on to Minnie's elbow to keep her from falling. She got a dish rag to fan Minnie's flushed face and heard Minnie whisper, Please, God, please protect my boy. That night, she talked to Charlie and begged him, Don't you have nothing to do with that white girl? There's nothing there for you but pain and misery. Oh, Mama, Charlie said as he wrapped his arms around her. I'm going to be fine. Ain't no white girl going to get me in no trouble. Minnie knew he wasn't listening. She felt the bile rise in her throat as she considered what might happen. She tried again and told Charlie the story she'd heard and what she'd experienced as a young girl. Charlie leaned in. I'm going to be fine, Mama. Honest. Minnie trembled. She knew this was bigger than anything Charlie could or would ever do. She longed for freedom and prayed it would come for all of them. Later, after a meal of cold ham and potato salad, she lay in Moses' arms, feeling some comfort, but knowing that even her big, strong, brave man couldn't stop the hands of time, the lot that was the black man's. She shuddered as she lay in bed, waiting for sleep to come. Summer became fall. The cotton was picked and taken to the gin, and the last of the vegetables from the summer garden were canned. Their brilliant colors shone through the smooth glass jars lined up on the pantry shelves. Buttery yellow squash, emerald green beans, bright red peppers and tomatoes, and golden corn. As Minnie surveyed the labor of these past months, she could taste the beans and rice covered with tomatoes and imagine the sausage that would be available soon as hog killing time was just around the corner. She moved from the pantry into the kitchen and remembered that the fall and winter garden was being planted that day and knew Charlie was planting turnips. She'd seen him that morning when she went out to empty the dishwater onto the grass. Turnips was one of her favorite vegetables, and she stood there at the stove and imagined dipping her cornbread into the pot liquor once those turnips were ready to be picked. The fear of what might happen to Charlie had receded somewhat, but it was still there. Her prayer for Charlie's safety was constant. She prayed as she fried the cornbread for supper that Charlie would mind what he did and that would be enough. She was icing the coconut cake when she heard Miss Martha crying as she came through the door and ran up the stairs. Then Minnie heard Martha and the master arguing. She took no mind of it but went about her business of cooking even though it did seem a bit strange as she had never heard the master yell at his daughter. Later that night, she was sitting on the front porch of their cabin with Moses, Charlie, and Trudy, her youngest, enjoying the coolness in the fall air. They were talking about Thanksgiving coming later that month and how the master and his family were going away for the holiday. This would mean all the slaves would have a bit more time to themselves. The pleasure of those thoughts was interrupted as Minnie saw a white-gowned figure coming through the grove of trees. She was puzzled until she saw the blonde hair shimmering in the rising moonlight and heard Martha calling Charlie's name. She rose from the porch with a mother's fierceness, told Charlie to get inside, and ran into the grassy meadow. Get back to the house, girl, for I tell your daddy. Martha was crying and paying Minnie no mind, calling Charlie's name over and over. Before Minnie could get close enough to grab hold of Martha and turn her round, her daddy came running through the trees, grabbed Martha, began to drag her back to the big house, turned, looked at Minnie in the eye and said, You tell that boy of yours to stay away from my daughter. Minnie stood there, stunned by the hatred in the eyes of this man who she had played with as a boy, this man she lay with when he called for her, this man who owned her. 
Her body trembled as she stumbled back to the cabin. She found Charlie inside with his daddy and Trudy, his eyes big with fear. No more of that bragging he'd been doing earlier. Trudy ran to it, into her arms as Charlie said, Mama, I swear I ain't been paying that girl no mind. She came to me this morning when I was planting, and I didn't even look up, just like you said, Mama. Minnie barely heard him. She told him, get to bed. We'll talk about this in the morning. She couldn't let herself believe there wouldn't be a morning for her boy. That night, she and Moses lay in bed talking about how they could protect Charlie. They even talked about maybe that they should all run, or maybe the master could sell Charlie to get him away from that conniving young girl who had her eyes set on him. Minnie thought that she could go to the master herself and ask him to sell her boy. She shuddered as she considered that possibility, but knew it might be the only way. Minnie was still lying awake some hours later when she heard the loud voices coming down the path to the slave quarters. She jabbed Moses with her elbow, leapt off the bed, shook Charlie out of his restless sleep, and pushed him out the window. She knew what that sound meant, knew at a place so deep she couldn't tell him anything but to run, and then fell to her knees praying. Moses knelt beside her. They heard the voice of the overseer calling for them and went out to the front porch, holding on to each other for dear life. A crowd of men stood in the grass beyond the porch. The overseer stepped forward, and Minnie was quick to tell him, My Charlie ain't done nothing. He ain't here. The overseer slapped her. The door to the cabin splintered as it kicked it down and stormed inside. Where the hell is that boy of yours, he yelled as he stomped back onto the porch. Minnie answered, I, I swear, I don't know, I don't know, I, I swear, you lying wench, he said. He hit her with the butt of his gun and told the men to get the dogs. Minnie lay in an unconscious heap, not even feeling Moses pick her up and take her back into the cabin. She woke to the cool rag he was using to wipe away the blood oozing from the wound on her face. She felt Trudy reach for her hand. They stared at each other as the hopelessness sank in, bringing them face to face with the stark reality that Charlie was in the woods by himself and white men with dogs were after him. There was nothing left but prayer. That was all they had. The sound of the horses pounding hoofs and the baying dogs hanging there in the air between them. And then they heard the words coming from the other cabins as a call and response began. Please, Lord, come. These words offered meager comfort as Minnie and Moses considered what was in store for their son. Please, Lord, please, come, please, sounded over and over in the night air and drifted in through their window as the sliver of a crescent moon rose over the trees.
three sisters, Rita, Frances, and Simone, stand on the raggedy, sagging porch, paint peeling from the rickety steps. They wave goodbye to the last of the visitors who came to pay respects to their granny on this, the day of her funeral. Rita notices the curve of old Mr. Rhodes' shoulders as he climbs into his rusty Ford truck, and a story spills out as a memory stirs. Remember how Granny said it was for her growing up poor and black? You know, the story she told us when we were little, the one about a hot Alabama summer night. She said the air was so thick, you could barely breathe, not even the promise of a breeze. Stillness being hugged by the hot, humid air, lynching was the order of the day, Granny said. Granny said that night the screams from the woods told the tale, cut through her heart. I remember Granny said she wondered who would be missing the next morning from the cotton fields and thought it would be Charlie who didn't listen to his mama when she told him not to look at that white woman, reminding him there was nothing there for him but pain and misery. I remember Granny said Charlie wasn't there the next morning when the cotton damp with dew was waiting to be picked and she never saw Charlie again. And the screams echo through the centuries as Rita, Frances, and Simone stand on the porch and remember As the last car edges down the path out onto Highway 52, Frances throws off her shoes, takes off her stockings, picks up a glass of cold iced tea, dripping with sweat, her and the glass, presses it to her face and moves to the chairs underneath the pecan trees, fans herself with the tail of her skirt to get even a whisper of a breeze moving her sisters follow, plopping down in the chairs, grabbing a piece of shade from the hot summer sun. Frances lifts her skirt from her damp, sweaty legs and wonders, what was that other story? You know, the one about when daddy came back from the big war but couldn't buy a house through VA because he was black. That's what Granny said. I remember she was mad talking about how her son fought in the big war, came back a hero to this Alabama town, but there was no room for black folks to live among the whites. And the banks wasn't about to lend money to folks living down in Baptist Bottom because we were a poor financial risk, so they said. I remember that right alongside Granny's anger. She talked about the deep sadness she felt when she saw her son back on the back porch, just back from the bank, his shoulders shaking with the grief of not being able to provide for his family, beaten down by the reality. No house for us to get a second mortgage when it came time for me to go to college. We scrimped and saved for years. You remember. Granny gave me her egg money. Mama took the iron and missed the Ghana shirts. Daddy worked the double shift. We all did without. Back then, I thought it was Granny talking, going on how she did about how white street black folks. But the other day in class, the professor said something that gave me great pause. She called it accumulation of wealth about how blacks don't have as many opportunities because of structural racism. She used the VA loans as one of her examples. I sat looking at that white professor and knew 
It was just like Granny said. Granny didn't know big words like accumulation of wealth and structural racism, but she knew. She knew. Leaves on the trees rustle with the whisper of a breeze. The sun moves behind the clouds. They remember these three women. A different kind of scream echoes, a scream nonetheless. They sit there deep in thought, each remembering her own story. The afternoon turns slowly to evening. The weather changes and rain moves in with a sudden force, the thick canopy of the trees no longer offering protection. All three run to the house, spilling iced tea and shoes and stockings onto the dry, withered grass. Trees sway in the windstorm on this day of their granny's funeral. Rita goes through the front door first, sits down with a heavy sigh on the overstuffed couch. Frances joins her, rests her head on Rita's shoulder. Simone chooses the chair where Granny usually sat. 
fingers the crochet doily, crisp with heavy starch, and tells her sisters what she's been wanting to say all along. You know, just the other night, Granny lay in her bed. The hospice nurse had just left through the front door saying it won't be long. Y'all had already gone to bed. Me sitting there holding Granny's hand, wiping her face with a cool cloth, loving her with all of me. I leaned in as I noticed her lips moving and I heard her say, Times, they are changing. Again, again, they're not. My heart broke when I heard the screams all the way from Florida. Granny's eyelids fluttered and she drifted off. I thought it was the morphine talking. I, I didn't know what she meant. She slept a while. Then, all of a sudden, she sat up, those black eyes flashing, and yelled out, Try not my mama heart scream! Her baby didn't even look at a white woman. All he did was walk through a wide neighborhood. Now, He's under the ground like Charlie all those years ago. Times, they are changing. And then again, they're not. That's what Granny said. I settled her back against her pillow and sat holding her hand, wondering what in the world had just happened. The moon rose up and shone through the window and settled there on her beautiful, time-worn face. She opened her eyes, looked at me with a clear gaze and whispered, Get the scream, Simone. Whatever you do, don't you and your sisters forget the screams. Rita, Francis, and Simone look at each other, taking in the words that have been said on this hot, humid summer day. Simone moves to the couch, leans into her sisters. Wind rattles the windows of the old house. Lightning flashes. Rain pours with a vengeance as the storm echoes the screams of all the pain, then and now. Times, they are a changing. And then again, they're not.
I think we're going to invite our facilitators to join us for leading our discussion after this work. Thank you so much for joining us. It's on. Green light. Check. Oh, there we go. Thank you all so much. Um, my name is Barbara Lau, I'm the director of the Pauli Murray Project, and I'm here with my colleague, Mamie Webb Bledsoe, who is also from the Pauli Murray Project. Get out from in front of this. You might know that one of the goals of the project is to try to engage uh, community, our community, in conversations about how history impacts contemporary issues. And I think you've given us a lot to talk about and think about. Um, and while I think that we may entertain a few questions for the, the gals on the stage, I think what's really important is for us to talk to one another. So this dialogue is going to be formatted so that we can respond to and think about what comes up for us after uh, witnessing this performance and think about how we can begin to talk with one another. Because as much as we've loved having you here, you're going to go home. You're going to go back to Florida. You're going to go back to Chicago. And we're going to be here. And the work that we do together is really important in terms of the ways that we work on these issues, uh, so many of which you've raised today here in Durham with each other. Because it's not going to change unless we work with each other. So the way we're going to do this is um, Mamie's going to ask a series of questions. We, we really believe it's important for everybody to be able to hear one another. So if you um, would like to join in, uh, raise your hand, and we will come and bring the mic to you so that everyone can hear what everyone else is saying. Um, and we'll get started, yeah? I think not standing in front of this stack of speakers, maybe. Why don't you come where I am, and I'll come over here. OK, the way we're going to start our series of questions is going to let us begin by first recalling what we just witnessed. So my first question for us is, what words or phrases stood out for you? I suspect it was divine providence that brought me here today. I was just dismissed from the hospital yesterday. Growing up in Montgomery, Alabama, I sat at the feet of my great-grandmother many times, who was 14 years old when the Civil War was fought. And she told many of the stories that you have recounted. So for me, your presentation is not an echo. It is the real thing. I was at home when we marched from Selma to Montgomery. <laughs> I was at home when we were pinned in by the Ku Klux Klan when the Freedom Riders came through. I had the wonderful experience of celebrating a marriage of 52 years with my husband, who was the immediate successor to Martin Luther King at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, which church sits in the shadow of the Alabama State Capitol, which was when the progressive members of my family founded that church, which is in a very prime 
piece of real estate in Montgomery right now as you breathe in the shadow of the capital of the Confederacy. So your presentation for me is not by any means an echo. It is the real thing. Thank you so much. What uh, you know, brought my attention to the world is changing, yet it's not changing. How long it would take. Other phrases, words you remember during the presentation? Anyone? I'm sorry. Structural racism. It's a good one, structural racism. Yes, ma'am. Mother pleading with Charlie echoes in my mind. Other lines of dialogue that you remember. Don't forget to scream. <laughs> Songs that you may have heard. Hmm. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Hmm. Other songs that you heard. When Johnny comes marching home. I see. No. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's so important that we have these kinds of presentations because it gives others the opportunity to really experience and share in the pain and suffering that we have experienced as black people. And I'd like to thank the artists for, present, for this presentation. Absolutely. Thank you so much. The prayers of the people from the cabins. Mm. Oh, Lord, come. As my friend Bertha said, don't forget to scream. And when many of us here were young, the people of, let's say, older, more mature people, <laughs> when we were young uh, and the civil rights movement was never young, but when it was going there in the 60s, we didn't mind screaming. We were young and nothing could embarrass us, not me anyway. We could embarrass our parents. But now, we do forget to scream. I don't know about you, but I'm retired. But for years, I had a job in which I could have screamed. I wouldn't even go out and wear something this exotic. <laughs> Forgot to scream. And it's a major theme in my life. And oftentimes it comes up like, did you say anything? No. Forgot to scream. But also, just coming here, we're still screaming. We are here and our cars are outside. And someone will wonder why we're already in here. I'd love to just inter interject for a second because we've had two comments saying that they are recalling that the text says, don't forget to scream. And the actual text is, don't forget the I'll screams. Scream. And it's really interesting how we're recalling mm -hmm. that it's our imperative 
to scream mm -hmm. when things are not the way that they should be. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> I think we also cannot forget the young woman that, that was attracted to Charlie. She, doesn't under, she didn't understand why. And he didn't understand why, but he knew that she was taboo. She, was, she could not understand, and society had not taught her yet that that was something that she was not supposed to do, was to engage with a, a, a black man. And she probably, to this day, if, if she were here, I would not understand. And what happened to her life after that? Who were the other characters? Anyone? I would like to play, pay tribute to the cello. <laughs> I think the voice of the cello. Thank you. Especially the lower tones, to me, sounded like groans. <laughs> Thank you. Names the other characters. Anyone? Moses, the father of Charlie. The granddaughters. As a grandmother, I was very touched by the granddaughters' concern and love for the grandmother. Would anyone like to take a stab at telling us what this story was about? Anyone? What is this story about? I'm taking a real stab. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the story is, is, is going back and um, the story is going back and it's talking about the beginnings of this country and how it was built on, on slavery and it evolved into, um, even after slavery was abolished, that we still had those lines of separation and that they did not merge. Uh, so people were freed, but they had nowhere to go. They didn't have any money. They didn't have anything that they could do. So therefore, they basically, they said they were free, but they stayed in the same areas. They, where were they going? And even when they went to the so-called freedom up north, uh, the regulations and things were still in place there. But it also talked about, I think the, the, the stunning part, of course, is when you transition so quickly from um, 18th, 19th, 18th century, and here we are today, and we're talking about Ferguson and holding your hands up. It's the same criteria was used to say that this black man had to have been doing something wrong. And even if he was, should he have died for a cigar? And so, and should Charlie have even been threatened with death because a young woman was interested in him, a young white woman. So it just says that we're still going through basically the same things. I think that we have to understand both sides of the picture. We have to understand what the white people were protecting, which is basically their lifestyle, and then what the black people were asking for. We also went into the whole thing about the, um, uh, the war and black people going to war and, and men saying, now when I come back, I fought with you, I bled with you, I have died with you, and now I want to come home and I want to share in this. And then we said, wait a minute, that part of it is over. And even the contributions of black men in, in the Great War uh, were never really acknowledged until recently. So it's, it's like uh, you hear all the time about this country, uh, we built this country but no one built it by themselves. And today we have other immigrants and other colors. And you think about that part of it and you, you have to say that these people also came here for a reason and we encourage them to come here for a reason. So it's an evolution, the only thing I can say. And I'm not gonna go over it all. <laughs> Thank you. I think I tend to deviate from your script because I look back over 85 years. Mm -hmm. I spoke to a very progressive group of white people in Chapel Hill recently, and I did use visuals. I'm not an accomplished musician, 
but I used very credible visuals. And I reminded them that in this country, we lift up the reality of capitalism. And I reminded them that over 400 years, the wealth of the South was built on the backs of people who were not immigrants, but captives. I also pulled from the internet 114 incidents of capitalistic contributions made in this country by my people. Some of them were actually corporate contributions, like the instance of the partnership between Sears and Roebuck. Mm -hmm. Roebuck was a black man. He was. I reminded them of the many scientific inventions and medical breakthroughs that my people have contributed. But because of the nature of my own training, I don't like to get up and pontificate. <laughs> so I went to your research, to the labor statistics of the United States, to the United States Department of Education and other sources to have some credibility. And I pondered, why is it when we've shown our genius in spite of horrific uh, restrictions and treatments, why is it that my people collectively have the least amount of wealth since you feigned integration in the public school system? Why is it that so many of my children have dropped out of school? And from personal experience, I have the answer to that question. Now, because of my age, I've done many things. I've worked in the corporation, which I found to be too cutthroat. So I went back to education. And in the public school system, you never pay teachers anything. Uh, but I chose to go back because it was a calling. I stayed long enough to inspire young black children to achieve to the highest heights and have stable perceptions of self and perform well. Now you would think that we might be the least intelligent in the country now and that we are the white man's burden. The media is a powerful thing. I look at connect a million my minds you don't see black males. You may see one or two black female children, but you don't see black males. I'm gonna end with this one observation. When I spoke in Chapel Hill to the group, most of whom were very progressive, there was one woman, white woman, came to me and she said, well, you know, I have a black friend. And she told me, that she would never want her, son, her daughters to marry a black man because they're such terrible people. That's not true of my sons and my grandson. Mm -hmm. My sons, and I don't tell too much about them because I don't want to be the source of an, a situation like the one that happened to the Muslims in Chapel Hill. So I don't boast about them anymore, but take it from me. They are among the highest achievers in this country, no matter what color. Mm. So I know there is no such thing as collective genius, nor is there such thing as collective inability to perform at a high intellectual level. Mm -hmm. Now that's all I have to say, <laughs> but I do what I can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So what association did you make with this performance? Do you want to say something? Thank you. I want to talk.
talk about two formative instances in my life <clears throat> regarding race. The first one occurred when I had a new baby. My husband was overseas, and I remembered that when he was at Duke, on his hall was a cleaning woman named Hallie White. She was black. She was a very fine person, and he uh, got along very well with her. And when we were getting ready to be married, he asked that a wedding invitation be sent to Hallie. She was invited, she came, she was sent to the balcony to sit. Mm. A couple years later, he was overseas during World War II, and we had a new baby. And I thought it would be very nice if Hallie could come and see this new baby, because she had been so fond of my husband. So I invited her to the house. Now this was a very small house. There was a front door that opened directly into the living room. There was not a hallway there. There was separated by an archway, a dining room next to the living room. Hallie came in, admired the baby, and then sat in the dining room, right next to the door, but not with me in the living room. And I said, Hallie, please come on in and sit closer to me so we can converse. She said, no ma'am. I know my place. My mother worked for Je General Carr. I know my place. The next incident occurred some years later when I was a librarian in, in, Rock, in Rock Hill, South Carolina. It was after integration. And somebody at another school decided it would be really nice if we could get acquainted with our new teachers because it's the faculties were integrated and we had uh, finally met professionally some people from the other race. And this person said, why don't we have a monthly social meeting and we could get acquainted with each other and know, them as know each other as individuals. So we did. And it was always at the house of a black person because it would not have stood for any uh, for it in the white community. Mm. But we ate together, we danced together to the music on the piano of a wonderful black uh, pianist, and we got acquainted with each other as friends, and I have still have some friends from that community. Now, what I want to say is that these two events took place 11 years apart. All right, only 11 years, and some people made the transition. But what has happened in the years since? Virtually nothing. How many times do we socialize with each other? We know each other professionally, perhaps. We don't socialize together. So I think that we need to work on that and do something more to make it happen. When is it gonna happen? <laughs> um, I was telling my sister who lives in Minneapolis about this program that I was going to attend and she said well what's the purpose of it and I said well to get rid of racism and she said well it's called screams and I said yes and she said but well, we're not going to stand on a street corner and scream. <laughs> what can we actually do? What can I do? I, I live in a retirement community surrounded by mainly uh, white women, as it were, and um, I don't know what I can do. Hi. Um this is my mother, uh, and just, you know, it's something I've been thinking a lot about, too, and I really appreciated your comment, Bobby, about uh, white privilege and something you think about every day, because I think there's racism, but then there's this continued white privilege where it allows people not to have to think about what actually is the role and what they need to be doing and how they need to change their mind. I mean, you look at what's happening in this state where we're increasingly systematizing 
racism in a way where they're changing voting rules based on race. They're changing districts to divide races so people can't run. And we all, many of us went to Moral Monday all year, and I registered voters all 2,500, a group that we started just last January, but we lost. And a friend of mine wrote a really great um, article in The New Yorker where, you know, all this beautiful feeling we all feel about, yeah, we get out there and we hear Reverend Barber and we, we're so proud of ourselves and we write posters, but then what do we do? And it's not enough. It didn't work last year and something else has to happen. So I'm with you, Mom. <laughs> I just want to share um, something I often do about Polly Murray and other people who've been activists is that, you know, one of the things is about being in it for the long haul. I'm reminded that people like Susan B. Anthony never got to vote, right? And she spent her entire life working on that particular issue. Polly Murray didn't get to see some of the changes and some of the policies that she fought for. So I think one of the hard things, obviously, is that you don't always see the change that you want to make but it doesn't mean that what you've done hasn't made a difference. And it's hard, it takes being together to help us stay energized to keep, keep doing that work. There's someone here and then we'll go here. Go ahead. I, I have to bring up different kind of screams. I was with Dr. King in Garrett Park, Illinois, when he was stoned. The screams, I get really goosebumps thinking about it. The screams that we heard directed at him are very different from the kind of screams you're talking about, but they go very deep and they last a very long time. I wanna say that I, I admire the kind of love that those girls had for their grandmother in, in the play because they would, you know, I could tell that they really loved their grandmother and their grandmother really loved them. And it makes me think of this um, slave that he lived years ago by the name of Frederick Douglass. He was raised by his grandmother because his mother was not allowed to keep him. And um, his grandmother raised some other grandchildren as well. And she made sure that they felt loved and that they were not afraid and they were not lonely. And it's so important to feel loved, even if you don't have much, you know, you don't have to have material things. If you feel loved, that's so important. And that's the way she, that grandmother made them feel. And I remember how heartbroken he was when he had to leave his grandmother to go to live on this plantation. And there um, on the plantation, his aunt worked there and she was there as a cook. She would cook the food for them, the children, and she would slight him. She would give him less food than his sisters and brothers. And um, one day she even threatened to starve him. She didn't like him for, I mean, she, she didn't have no reason to dislike him. She just disliked him for no reason at all. So he really, he, he was hurt by that. when. Um, she would feed the other children. She got to the point where she wouldn't even give him anything. But um, so leaving his grandmother really, you know, it was really a, a devastating time for him. And it just was really heartbroken for him. But one day when his mother, his mother was able to visit him one night. And so she told him how, um, he told her how his um, aunt had threatened to starve him. And she happened to have um, a little heart-shaped cake that she um, gave him to eat. And she said, I'm not going to let anyone starve you to death. And so um, she told the, the aunt, she told her all, but it didn't really do any good as um, far as her feelings for Fred. Well, so she still had those same feelings, but the one visit that she gave her son made a difference in his life. And she was not able to visit him after that because she had passed away. But that one visit made him feel 
he knew that um, he was loved by her even though she wasn't able um, to raise him. He knew that he was not only a child, but somebody's child, that, and he was loved by his mother. So love is very, very important. To feel love can motivate you and help you to go on in the midst of your trials and tribulations. Hi. Um, well, I was just listening to the script, and I remembered when I was in preschool, I was best friends with a boy, and I can't remember his name, but he was white. and. Um, he had an older sister, and once we became like really good friends, she she started bullying me because she said that she didn't want a black girl to be best friends with her white brother. And I didn't know like really what that meant, and so I still tried to be friends with him, but then he started pushing me away too, and I got really sad. And then it's like I kind of started to learn like what they meant by like people not wanting like us to integrate or racism. Mm -hmm. And after that, I kind of thought that I wouldn't like really encounter situations like that again, but it's like a couple of times I've had to deal with people who didn't really like want to be my friends or didn't want their friends to be my friends because I was black and mm -hmm. it kind of hurts my feeling, but sometimes I just have to like kind of let it go. But it just remind me of the play. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Mm. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Good, e Good evening, everybody. Thank you, every everyone, for coming. But I think we can start at this point. And I'm not saying it to, um, I'm just saying it because I think this is where we need to start. The term privileged and white. If we can just stop using that term. I'm an African-American woman. I feel like I'm privileged to be the granddaughter of a man who started our family church. I think I'm, I'm privileged to be the daughter of the parents who raised me with values. We're all privileged. But I think if we can just start at that one point, because in essence, it's saying I'm better. And if we can start there to understand that we're all the same, we want the same for America, we want the same for Durham, we want peace, and as a mother of, of a, um, someone asked the question, what's the correlation between the two? When you raise a young black man, the fear that you have when they leave to go out just to socialize with their friends basically takes you back to their going out and you don't know if they're gonna come back alive because they may be lynched. We have a different perspective when it comes to our young men. And that fear doesn't leave, I don't care how old they get, you still have that fear. So we can start with just not associating privilege because you're white. I think that can begin a better dialogue between the races. And I thank you so very much for being here today. If I could just go back in order to make my point um, to the cellist. And the music was so pro profound for this because what I heard was a constant beat, but going back to the sorrow. A constant beat, but going back to the pain. And that is what it's like to be African American. We live, we progress, but there's a collective pain that we live with. It's in our DNA. It's in how we parent our children. Um, I don't agree with the comment that was just made about separating white privilege. That is a fact. We cannot deal with the realities unless we call it what it is. And if you are white, you are privileged. That's the way our society is set up. But I have those same fears for my daughter because she is a woman and I understand what it is to be a woman and to be looked at as less than because you are a woman. So in order for us to really combat what's going on, we have to call it what it is. And our children, they suffer because they are prejudged when they go into the classroom. They might already uh, be ahead of the class, but the teacher, because not, not because of who she is, but because of how we were socialized. And that's the problem. We are breaking down barriers of structural racism. The things that we have to deal with, our grandparents, our parents, socializing us and training us to be careful. But we don't know why we should be careful. But it's too deep to explain, but just be careful because I love you. 
and I deal with that now with my son. So we need to call it what it is, and that's how we can move forward, I believe. I, I want to congratulate you on such a beautiful program. It is very touching. I remember as a young child, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, which was a kind of a mixed area where I grew up. And in elementary school, and I'm going back into the late 40s, there was a sign in my school that I still remember. And the sign said, how lucky am I to be an American, to be white, to be Christian. What a way to brainwash kids. Oh, my God. And, you know, I, I just, just still remember it. And that they allowed that back then was just disgraceful. And I want to thank you again for a beautiful program. I just, it was, uh, I was relating to what that beautiful young woman, young woman, <laughs> just said about um, children coming into kindergarten and being prejudged, or pre-kindergarten, -pre, pre and being prejudged. And I saw this program yesterday and was so powerfully affected by it that I had to see it again. And I am very privileged to be here again today to hear them. But last night, I couldn't sleep. I mean, it was just really hard getting to sleep after seeing this. And, and the tune just popped into my head and would not stop revolving from South Pacific. You have to be taught. You have to be carefully taught. Hmm. And that really is what she was talking about. And can I just say something right quick? Um, being that back home I work at an elementary school and <laughs> thank you um, I, I work with kindergartners every day and to see when they first walk through the door on day one how they separate them even working at a school in the urban core. I watched them move the children to different classes. My class is predominantly African American and mixed children. And their parents, one, either the father or the mother is African American. As compared to my neighbor's classroom, her students are predominantly Hispanic or mixed with a Hispanic parent because she's of that descent and they strategically place them with teachers that look like them. So although they say we're together, we're still separated like cattle. And to watch them, the only time they mingle is during enrichment, which is maybe 30 minutes out of the day and then they go back to their home that's predominantly the same color as them. And once again, we're taught to be separate, but equal. So I definitely understand where you're coming from with the, you have to be taught, carefully taught, because that's what we do every day, even in a public school system. We teach them carefully to be separate. 